You're listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. You can hear the show live Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN and streaming at accesswdun.com. You can find all things Martha Zoller at marthazoller.com. We have a little excitement uh, at the end of qualifying on Friday, and Josh Clark was a part of it, and so we're talking to him today. Josh is running for the 49th uh, Senate District. He was formerly a member of the Georgia House. He also ran for the United States Senate in 2022. Welcome back to the program, Josh. How are you? I'm good, Martha. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. How are you? Good. So tell us what led to you running for this seat. Well, thank you, Martha. But you know what? It actually began a long time ago. And uh, as you mentioned, I served in the state house, term limited myself, went home, went back to, uh, you know, just being a citizen. And then felt in 2020, felt so concerned and frightened for the direction of our country that we stepped up and tried to help reclaim that Senate, U.S. Senate seat. And then after that, um, Last year, I had a friend ask me if I would pray about, uh, in fact, a guy who had walked away from everything to help my help me run just as a volunteer. And uh, he said, Josh, will you pray about running uh, the General Assembly again? And I said, listen, you know what? I'm willing to run for dog catcher, whatever that we can do to make a difference. It's a battleground state. We've got to step up. So we did. And um, then I had several people say, will you run for this seat? And my wife and I prayed about it. We said, no, we do not think we should run against the incumbent. But if the seat opens, our, you know, our prayer was, then that will be a sign. But we never thought that would happen. So when I got the phone call on Friday that uh, somebody called me just out of the blue and said, hey, Shelly hasn't qualified to run. And I said, oh, I know she's going to. And anyway, we ended up realizing that something was happening that was um, that didn't make any sense. So anyway, I ended up last. My wife and I said, well, we should at least drive down there. We did pray that if it was open, we said we were willing. So, yeah, we got in with just minutes to spare. And so now I am running for state senate, as you said, District 49, which encompasses all of Hall County. Yeah, and so did you go down there Thursday, too? Because I think I saw you on Thursday. Oh, okay. No. To be honest with you, this is crazy. I guess when you pray about something, you should probably... I guess pay attention, but I wasn't even watching who was qualifying because I was certain she had told everybody she was running again. Uh, and I, I show a lot of people that. So I, I didn't even think about it. It wasn't right. even on my radar. So do you, Josh, when we talked for the Senate race, you were living in Gwinnett County. So are you living in Hall County now? Oh, I've, no, I was living in Hall County, Flowery Branch. We moved there uh, in 2018. Yeah, well, we so have, you uh, represented Gwinnett County, is that right? That's true. Yeah. Okay, Back in uh, 2010, I represented um, Swanee, Sugar Hill, and Buford. That's correct. Yep. Okay. So so, we so, love, in fact, my our son graduated from West Hall. So uh, Stephen, and, Stephen Clark, and then uh, we have five children that are at Lanier Christian Academy. I coached cross country there, um, actually elementary, middle, and high school. So we, we love this county, and we got to make sure that we continue to fight quality of life and protect Lake Lanier. And, you know, I served on the Lanier Caucus back, um, you know, many years ago before I term limited myself and quit But um, at the end of the, the term. But I, this is, this is a, to me, this is, George is great. Okay, George is the best state in the nation. I was born and raised here, but Hall County is where it's at. You've got it all. So we are grateful to uh, to be here, and I just love the opportunity, the privilege to finally keep this state um, with a great place to raise the next generation. And that's I think that's what the battle's over right now. And so this will be a fairly short election. So how, what's your strategy, and what are going to be your main issues? Well, our strategy is to take nothing for granted and get out there and reach, talk to the people. They're the ones I'm going to work for. They're be my bosses. I always said. Um, I needed to, when I served before, I reported back every week. Every week I would tell them, you know, what I did because I made the promises on the campaign trail, and then I need to keep those promises. So I'd keep them in my office, um, laid out right there, every every mailer, everything I said I'd do, and then I'd send a newsletter every week. So we're going to keep that promise again. I'm going to make that promise again, and I'm going to keep it. And we're going to win this um, thanks to an amazing team. You know, Martha, you know when I ran for U.S. Senate, um, 
that was, you know, that was certainly a daunting task to, uh, to, to get in last in the race and campaign over the entire state. But God bless us, an amazing team. And they are all, most of them are all, I mean, nobody said no yet, but they're all just reaching out, lining up, saying, we're with you. And that's so humbling. So we're going to work our tail off. We're going to get all over this county. And um, I'm excited. You know, 72 days, one, or actually down to 70, I guess, one county. And we can do this. We can do this. So the issues that I believe are just top issues, as you asked, immigration is really huge to me. I- I've been talking about it. Um, it's a burden because we've got to protect this state. We've got sanctuary cities in this state that we've got to put an end to that. We cannot have people, you know, our kids like Lincoln and Riley, who was murdered needlessly. So that immigration, I believe that is huge. Our economy Folks are struggling. Chuck and I keep talking about it every time we go shopping. We're taking things. I mean, we've changed our what we eat, our diet, based on the cost, the inflation. And so we do everything we can to continue to spread this economy, um, to keep taxes down, to help reduce red tape. I traveled, Mark, with the state, um, across the state, the Red Tape Initiative. I served on Small Business and Job Creation Committee in the past, again, before I term limited myself, but back during, during that time of serving, that was one of my favorite things. We've got to help small businesses. I'll fight for them. I grew up on a small farm. We've got to fight for the ag community. Um, that's a driver for this state. Um, and, and, so, and then the education. I have six kids. One of them graduated, as I said, from West Hall. We've got great schools in this county. But we've got to also look out for the schools across the state because I, we've got a lot of concern over that because if it's about the next generation, then education should be a top a top issue as well. And I think the biggest thing is making sure that we, the next state senator, and that you give me that opportunity, the people of this great county, Hall County, will give me that opportunity. I'm going to do apply a five-way test to every bill. And when I hit the ground down there, I hit the ground running immediately. Um, I know how to get to work right away and get it done. And we got to first ask every bill. It's not is it my friend that authored this bill? But is this bill going to benefit the next generation? Does it reduce government or expand government, the proper role of government? Um, you know, is it, does it pass a smell test? You know, is it the, the, the corruption smell test? Does it support family values? And for me, everything comes back to family. If you've got strong families, you've got a strong community. You have strong churches. And you have a strong, limited government. So, Mark, we've got a lot to do right now. There's a lot at stake yeah, so let me ask you one question, because obviously you're going to have to get, let people get to know you. I mean, you've been in Hall yeah. County for a while, but your opponent, Drew Eccles, has been, you know, in the community for a long time. Most of his adult life, he's worked with community issues all yeah. throughout. So you're up against a kind of a, a person that is very well known in Hall, Hall County. How are you going to address that? Well, you know, and I don't want to take away from anything from him. I appreciate them, appreciate their family. Um, I, I don't think the way you do it is registered in the last hour, but, but I don't want to take anything away from what he has done in this community. I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and, but I believe this is the people's seat, and I think my, my job is to get out and let them know, hey, I'm here. Um, I want to listen to you. I want to hear from you. I want to work for you. I want to serve you. And let them decide that. But when I ran in Gwinnett County, um, people told me I had no chance when I ran initially. I mean, I don't come from wealthy connections, and you know, I, I don't, I don't have, I didn't have all that behind me. I'm the oldest of ten children, grew up on a small farm in Swanee. Um, you know, very humble beginnings. And people said you don't have a chance. Good luck. But you know, we won seventy thirty because of an amazing team and people who are willing to give me a chance. And I think they, they just understood that why I was running. And they said, all right, you know, we're going to give you that chance. I never forgot that. I'm never going to forget the great folks of Hall County who uh, I pray will give me that chance. And it's true. I've not been here all my life. Um, but I definitely am blessed. I have a lot of friends who have been here all their life. And they can vouch for me and who I am. And, and, and they can look at my record at the state house. And I think they'll see that I fight for, I'll fight for Hall County value because I've done it. <laughs> you know, it's not just a campaign promise I've, I've kept it and i limited myself so they know i'm not some career politician coming in here you know wanting to you know what i mean come here be here forever and and just you know make it about me it's about service so josh clark and we're a big speaking of service my whole family is serving the military i i did it but i say 
four of my, I say my whole family, four of my brothers served, three of them are serving now. We're about service. Josh Clark, if people want to know more, how can they do that? Um, thank you. I would invite them to go to votejosh.com and enter, please enter your, your email address. I want to keep you up to date on what's going on. You can sign up to be a part of this. We would love for you to join the team. It's going to be a lot of families, um, a lot of great folks from young to retired that are part of this team. And we would be so humbled, so honored to work with you. But first of all, just check out, and more is coming on the website. You know, like I said, even though my wife and I had prayed earlier this year, if you want me to serve, then open up the seat. Um, again, we didn't think it was going to happen. We were surprised as anyone else for it to happen at the last hour like it did. But um, the whole website will be up soon with all the issues that we discussed and, and more. But votejosh.com. Josh Clark, thanks for being with me today. Martha, thank you for having me. It's local radio, and that's why you're listening. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Drew Eccles is here with me now. Welcome, Drew. Good morning, Martha. It's good to be here with you. So tell us a little bit about what led up to you deciding to run and then the kind of logistics for Friday. Well, um, first off, I'm going to go ahead and and say, look, I have uh, the hardest working, most beautiful uh, wife uh, who's a senator and serving the 49th uh, right now. Uh, And look, I don't know, uh, last year, uh, it was new to us. She got sworn in in January. Uh, you've been around politics a long time, and it was new to us. It was um, it was exciting. You know, there was new good things. There were new bad things. Um, and I think maybe Drew and Shelly both. Um, it was new to our kids, um, but we're seeing all the, the politics and this and that and, and didn't may have not have been looking at Cohen and Chloe as hard as we should have been. Uh, Chloe just had moved to University of Georgia, and Cohen. Uh, a lot of you know that a lot of your listeners know Cohen is uh, special needs. Cohen has Down syndrome. He's at North Hall High School. So, you know, rewind to that, and then fast forward to this session, and um, and this whole time has been pretty tough on Cohen. It's been very very difficult. Um, you know, over the past few days, I've told some people that. Um, you know, hopefully I can be half as good a senator as my wife. Uh, I can work hard and I can be thorough and I can be responsive to uh, to the constituents of the 49th. But what I can't do, I can't be his mom. Uh, Shelly's been his structure his entire life. And, and I could I could tell people stories about that over and over and over again, but we won't get into the details of that. But she's done so much for him since he was born and, uh, and he needs his mom. And um, and we prayed and we prayed and um you know it's the very non-traditional way to go and qualify on friday you know at at 10 30 or 10 45 whatever whatever time it was but uh we thought about it and we prayed about it a whole lot and um and we've been at peace the past the past couple weeks we have um even before the decision was made we had changed things in our house um the way we parent and the way uh the time that you know we were spending with COVID and just trying to make you know paying paying more attention and and those type things we feel good about where we're at so you know the basically you all made the decision you went in there together there was a little buzz because Shelly had not qualified yet and people were under the assumption she was going to so you qualified and then of course you released the statement And then you found out that you were going to have an opponent. So tell us how you're going to approach the campaign. Because I've known you a long time, and I know that service has been a part of what you've thought about doing for a long time, as well as you've been a part of this community. Your family and you, your adult life, you've you've worked in this community as well as your family for, gosh, over 100 years. So how are you going to approach this campaign? Well, um, you know, from a... um from a perspective of, of working, I, listen, there's a lot of people that can say a whole lot of things about Drew Eccles, okay, like him or not, but there's very few people that's ever going to question my work ethic, and it don't matter if it's out in a field at Jay Moore Farms. Look, I pick strawberries. If I have to pick strawberries, I don't just ride around in the truck and tell people to pick strawberries. I dig ditches. Uh, when it comes time to put out signs on the side of the road, you're going to see Drew out there with the post driver driving the signs. That's what I did during Shelley's campaign. Uh, I'm going to work. And I'm going to work so hard to earn the votes of the people in the 49th. 
I'm going to, um, you know, we look forward to winning this thing, and I'm going to work um, like a dog as your senator. Um, we're going to work hard. Um, I've served. Look, um, the chamber, the hospital, um, various uh, roles and, and responsibilities across the county. Georgia Georgia Farm Bureau, um, and I appreciate my opponent um, being a champion for agriculture. I, I appreciate that. Somebody texted me and told me that he mentioned agriculture. I appreciate that because, listen, that's near and dear to my heart. But there's a lot of issues right here that we have to um, – that we have to address. I feel like that Hall County, Georgia, you go back to um, just the tremendous amount of leadership that's come through this county statewide. I feel like Hall County is a, a beacon on the hill, so to speak. We do a lot of things right. Um, we do some things wrong. Uh, but we have to continue to lead right here in this district. And, and what we need is somebody that's been here. We need somebody that's rooted in this community, that's worked hard, that's sweat in this community, that's cried with this community. And I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be the guy that just works relentlessly um, for this district. What do you see as the biggest issues for this seat? Well, I think that there's our commission's done a great job with um, – they're, they're working hard with transportation issues, but there's a lot of things that there's a lot of state roads here in Hall County that there's some issues that need addressing. So, listen, I live right on the side of my business is right on the side of Highway 365. Uh, you can't get out on that road. You, you can't do it. Uh, that corridor, the 52 corridor, we have all these other um, state roads here in the county, 60 um just I can name them all that we need improvements. We need people looking at this. We need somebody that can facilitate these issues. I've been working um, all my life, again, volunteering and serving in different capacities. I think transportation is a big one. I think it's a very, very big one, and I it's going to be the, going forward. It's the one thing I hear from every person, whether I meet them in the grocery store or I bump into them somewhere, is how much traffic there is. Now, I mean, and I, there's no way around having traffic That's because right. this We're, is a county people want to move to. You're going to have traffic, but you've got to figure out how to facilitate it. And we need to be proactive. And I, th- I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be huge going forward. That's going to be big for the next 20 years. Um, so that's that's a big deal. Um, we got to take care of this lake. Uh, we have to take care of the lake. Um, that is uh, it's the lifeblood of Hall County. Um Northeast Georgia Medical Center. I'm fortunate enough to serve on the community advisory board there, and it's just amazing what that hospital does for this community. I mean, you think about all the employees, um, and and I don't know. I'm not a statistics person. I don't know the dollar figure, the economic impact, so to speak, but so many people are tied to that hospital. 11,000 employees. I just saw the presentation from Carol Burrell last week. 11,000 employees. It is such a blessing to have that in this community. And, you know, every now and then you hear these stories where somebody, you know, they didn't have a great experience or whatever. But I'm telling you that when you get out in rural Georgia and there's no health care, that there's significant problems. So we are so fortunate to have that. There's going to be medical issues, health care issues coming before the Senate nonstop. Um, for the next few years, and and somebody's got to defend Northeast Georgia Medical Center, and I'm the guy that's going to do it. So your opponent obviously isn't as well known in this community, and and he's going to, but he's run for office before. So does that inform at all how you're going to run, or does that are you just running your race? I am running my race. I am going to work. Uh, it's it's funny, but I'm going to work <laughs> like I'm on my farm with a shovel in my hand trying to get the best bang for buck while I'm out there on the streets every single day. I'm going to try to be efficient. I'm going to try to be timely. I'm going to try to talk to as many people as I possibly can. I'm going to be talking to some of you guys, some of the listeners, when I'm on a tractor at night. Uh, like I'm going to be tomorrow night. If you'll take my phone call or text message, I will. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to anybody. So uh, I'm just going to work hard. That's it. Do you have a philosophy on term limits at all? I believe in term limits. I think that uh, you know uh, the state of Florida is. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they have some st- term limits in their st- state house. And if you look, you know the state of Florida sends some uh, really strong candidates to. Um, to uh washington dc and to their governor's office and places like that they um so they 
you know, do your job, do it for, you know, three, four terms, whatever it is, and and, and move on. Um, I think it's good to I, – I think it's important, though, the, probably the most important is that, you know, we're um, – maybe grooming's the wrong word but we're we're keeping young people plugged in to uh to what's going on and and not just making it a uh, um we need we need to be training folks we need to to make young people aware of the issues. Well, I tell you one of the things um that I'm I'm on the I'm the ninth district representative for the state board of education and one of the things that I'm really happy we're doing is that we have approved over the last few months to take construction, agriculture, a couple of other of what we call CTAEs and start them in elementary school. Now, granted, we're not going to necessarily teach them how to do the jobs in elementary school, but we're going to teach them the math that's involved in it. We're going to teach them how to measure, how to, you know, how certain jobs are done so that when they get to high school and they get offered this opportunity to do a work study or to do something like that, they've already had a little bit of exposure to it and they might have an opinion about it. And I'm really excited about that. I was at the uh, Capitol a couple weeks ago, and uh, and Youth Leadership Hall came down there, and I was so proud of those kids. Um, so many of those kids from all these high schools across Hall County. Oh my gosh, man! They're so smart. They're so um, you know they look you in the eye, they talk to you. Uh, there's that's that's an issue. You know they, these folks, these kids can communicate. Uh, I was also on my farm. It's funny you even say that. I had. Um, an FFA leader um, on my farm. He did an externship with me last year, spent a week with me. And when he got out of the truck, he said, uh, what What are you looking for? And, and what, what should we be teaching? And I said, you need to be teaching kids how to read a tape measure. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the week, he said, is your, your opinion changed? And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you can read a tape measure, you can do a lot of things. If you it's can so add true. and subtract <laughs> fractions, you can do a lot of things. You can accomplish a lot in life if you can do that. Drew Eccles, so tell me, um, if people want to help you, how can they get in touch with you? So, um, We'll have the website up, like like uh, we talked about earlier. This so you was, did not uh, have the website. Don't have the up website Friday. yet, yeah. but uh, okay. by the end of the week, it'll be up. Probably today or tomorrow, it'll be up, and it'll be vote Drew, Um, You know, uh, I'll take uh, personal Facebook messages on Facebook. You can find me at Drew Eccles. Um, and, uh, and listen, uh, I know this is crazy, but your listeners, uh, they're not going to have to ask many people in Hall County, but seven seven zero five four zero one eight zero two. um, y'all can call me, um, shoot me a text message. Uh, that may be the most insane thing I have ever done in my life. But, I did it. Uh, I did hey, it. Uh, call me, shoot me a text message, and, and I'll I gotta get back tell to you, you. People have been respect. I haven't, you know, my number's been out there forever. And I gave it out when I ran for Congress. And I've never really had people abuse it, except for the people that are trying to sell me Medicare now. I'm going to be Medicare age this year, and they're trying to sell me <laughs> Medicare. And I get like 100 phone calls a day on that. But that's crazy. Anyway, votedrewackles.com. We're going to have you back a lot. And thanks for being here today. Thank you, Martha. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Bill Crane is here with me right now. And, of course, Bill, you know, the fait accompli is is done, that we know we're going to have um, Joe Biden and Donald Trump in a rematch. And we're going to have uh, Robert Kennedy says he's going to get on all the ballots and a couple of other candidates. So what are your takeaways from yesterday's primary? That Donald Trump in Georgia still pulls a a significant percentage of Republican base voters, but still is soft among independents and those not aligned with either party and either Joe Biden or Donald Trump need those voters to win in November. There is still in my mind a lane in the middle that no candidate of those we've discussed is announced or claiming and with the right tactician and resources, a path. But right now, you're right. The the big three are Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and I believe Donald Trump will carry Georgia and um, Robert Kennedy with you know the Green Party and a few others out there getting on some ballots in certain states because, as we know, the thresholds and the petition process vary by state. 
Yeah, they do. And um, it is one thing Democrats and Republicans agree on. They don't want anybody else on the ballot. So they make it more difficult to get on the ballot if you're an independent candidate. There was some talk of Kennedy possibly being libertarian, um, uh, which would give him easier ballot access in most places. Because they they already have ballot access, I think, 48 states from prior cycles and for the not to get too granular with the listeners, but if you meet a certain ballot threshold, a certain number of elections statewide, you get to stay on the ballot. You don't have to go through the petition process every election. That's right. So what do you think, honestly, um, like, OK, so about 20,000 people voted for Nikki Haley yesterday um, in sort of, I guess, a protest vote. I don't know. I, I was s- one of them. I'll go ahead and admit it. Yeah. I mean, and I voted early for Nikki Haley, so I don't mind. Yeah, me too. You know, so I... Um, what I've se- what I'm seeing is, or what I think is going to happen, is I said I said last week there's roughly a two to four week window where we might hear we might hear what Nikki Haley's going to do. Um, is is Trump going to reach out to her to come down and visit? It, is that going to happen? I don't know. Some people say no, no way, it couldn't happen. Other people say that there are talks that are already happening where. There might be something that could happen. But regardless of how it happens, sometime by the convention, but probably in the next few weeks, there has to be, you know, some kind of outreach to the anywhere from 17 to 30 percent of Nikki Haley voters that there are to make them want to unite. I mean, there's a lot of messages today on social media about how the party needs to unite. The party needs to unite. Yes, they do. But what are they going to do to, to, un, to unite the party? Yeah, just, just claiming it needs to happen is not sufficient. And the same problem exists for Joe Biden. Different reasons. He's got, depending on which polling you're looking at, he's got a problem with young voters. He has a softness with African-American voters that, if that continues, he can't win the White House. And he has a particular softness with African-American men. And whether you want to point to his cognition issues or his age or the Palestine or issue promises not kept from his prior campaign, all of those collectively add up to a lot of lack of enthusiasm. Just look at the difference in the crowd size last week with Donald Trump in Rome. And and the turnout for the primary. I mean, it was basically decided. I mean, there was no competition on either side, and it was two-to-one turnout, Republicans for Democrats. That group that was trying to get people not to vote on the Democrat side, they sent a press release out this morning that said they were only 15,000, that 15,000 people pulled ballots and didn't vote for president. So it's not a huge number. So there is a real enthusiasm gap on the Democrat side. And when that's happened in Georgia, if you look backwards at prior cycles, when the GOP or the Democratic Party has been that dominant in the number of ballots pulled because there wasn't really any question yesterday. There were almost 500,000 early votes cast, but there wasn't really any question yesterday of who was going to win by plurality or majority, either of those two primaries. When it's a two-to-one gap like that, that tends to show up in the November results. Right. Right. So obviously primaries for both parties are the party faithful. That's the people that turn out, the people that vote no matter what. I'm one of those people. You're one of those people. But the electorate is much bigger. So you get much bigger than on on presidential election day. So I guess the number one thing is getting people out to vote. I heard a lot of very strong Trump supporters uh, talking about banking the vote they really you know where trump for a while was not talking about voting early he was talking about everybody should go on election day and it should be paper ballots and all of that but the people like the rnc and others are saying we got to do the early vote thing we've got to get if you're not comfortable with an absentee ballot then you got to get out and early vote well remember it was georgia republican governors who gave us the opportunity to early vote and in you know, three weeks of advanced voting and voter identification and absentee voter identification and no excuse absentee voting. This shift, if you will, towards we got to use paper ballots and we can only vote on election day. That's recent. And and I would point, not saying that Republicans haven't more traditionally voted on election day, but the push by the parties to vote on election day, that's really only in the last six or eight years. I mean, Donald Trump is the person who suggested drop boxes. Donald Trump is the person who said on a federal level, I don't trust the U.S. Postal Service, particularly in Democratic strongholds in blue states, to deliver absentee ballots. So let's put drop boxes where the elections are being held. 
I don't think anybody knows that, Bill. It's been, well, I'll I'll send the sites. It, it was his <laughs> suggestion. No, I I believe you, and I I think it's funny too. Just to talk about something different is that um, he's he sometimes he mentions Operation Warp Speed, which I think is one of his great accomplishments. Whether you like the vaccine or not, I love the it's, vaccine. It's, I haven't had COVID again, and yeah. and I'll just say again, he he selectively chooses which parts of his own past he'll acknowledge. It's just. Yeah, and there wouldn't we wouldn't have the vaccines today if it hadn't put in the money and the White House hadn't pushed for the grants to the pharmaceutical companies that were global, but we were the biggest funder to get the vaccines as quickly as we did using existing research that had already been done by the National Institutes of Health and the CDC. And it should be, I mean, sometimes people boo him when he brings it up in in his own crowds, and other times they cheer. I think it's an interesting group. But now they should pivot. Both of them should be pivoting to the general election. Here's what I see. I see that Biden still is shoring up his base, so he can't pivot yet to the general election, but that Trump does have a secure base, so he should be pivoting to the general election. And both of them need to understand the the issue instead of for example my column this week posted on accesswdun.com talking about as as the president often does the last contest was stolen from him and and, and continuing to attack dominion voting systems etc and of and the current president saying that democracy is at risk whichever of these two men win and we'll assume one of them will we will still have a democracy we will still have a us constitution and life will go on and i'll just point to here in georgia Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger as two examples of that. They upheld the state's constitution and law and did what they could legally, and they will do so again. Well, I tell you, you know, one of my pet issues are the bud- is the budget. And yesterday, the president, or day before yesterday, he put out his $7.3 trillion budget, <laughs> which had something for everybody. But what, what I think is most notable is... Is that there? Uh, it basically he figured, okay, well, I'm just going to keep spending at COVID levels. Is what he what he's saying. So I did a little digging. Um, in 2019, we spent 4.4 trillion dollars, which was a 900 billion dollar um, uh, deficit. Okay, if you assume inflation, then we should be today be at a 5.2 trillion dollar budget, and the president wants 7.3 trillion now democratic operatives i've talked to said nobody expects him to get it he if he gets 10 percent of what he's asked for he'll be happy but it just is ridiculous to me that you would intentionally propose a budget that is two trillion dollars over what we are projected to bring in we are continuing on a path that's not only non-sustainable but that the interest on the national debt is almost equivalent to the gdp um you know, and then people don't like to hear me say this, but when people cheer when a baseball park or a sidewalk or a local library is funded with federal dollars, that should not happen. If the community wants a baseball field, if the community wants a sidewalk, if the community wants name the initiative, it should be funded either locally or by the state. The federal government should not be the funder of first resort that continually just steps in and cuts a check that our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren may never be able to honor. Well, and the dirty little secret is that even though um, there are a lot of Republican governors out there who, uh, and all governors, do a great job balancing their budgets, the fact of the matter is, in most states, Georgia included, their budget, which is going to be, you know, in the 30s this year, um, $30 billion, uh, it's there's about that much in federal money coming in too for things. So the dirty little secret is that these governors really don't want the federal government to get in their fiscal house in order because if they do, there'll be less money coming to the state. No, states. starting starting with Medicaid expansion, you know, yep. that 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 was supposed to fade away and be funded by the states at year ten. We're now at year fourteen. Yep. There hasn't been any talk about it rolling back. Nothing ever goes away from the federal government. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's why I supported Johnny Isaacson's biennial budget bill, because it was it was modeled after what they do in Texas, that you pass a two year budget and then in the off years you do oversight. You look for overlap. You look for, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it made perfect sense, but it would shine too much of a light. You know, they don't want to be efficient. And it that includes both presidential candidates 
They don't, neither one of them talk about budget controls. And, you know, we're going to have to do it eventually. Bill Crane, thank you so much for being with me today. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. This week, we do know now who the nominees of the major parties are going to be. While they won't be actually nominated until their conventions, we now are in the longest general election cycle that we have ever had in America. And so I wanted to talk to Roger Gewalb about a couple of things today. And I know he's commented on this and he's met the former president before and been to Mar-a-Lago and wanted to talk a little bit about uniting the Republican Party because you guys do a little bit of that in your own country where you've got to put these coalitions together. Um, We've pretty much been a two-party system, but there's there's roughly 30 percent of primary voters that have voted for other candidates, mostly Nikki Haley, but other candidates. And um, how what's your advice on how people need to be brought together um, in the Republican Party? That's a really tough question. Um, I think the divisions are so strong and so deep that it's not easily solved. Uh People are divided over, gosh, um, well, as Bill Clinton said long ago, it's the economy, stupid. Um, they're also divided over immigration. People, you know, folks just pouring through the border still. Um, they're divided over crime. Uh, convention in Chicago, which is just a, an absolute mess, uh, always goes to the Democrats. They get 90% of the black vote at the moment. They're apparently on 60%. The black Americans in Chicago are so fed up with the immigration situation. Um, Same thing mirrors itself with the divisions over immigration to a certain extent in the Republicans. So immigration, economy, money for Ukraine, uh, Middle East, Israel, American troops and Houthis. I mean, just everybody's got an opinion, and the new uh, societal mode is to, you know, really get very angry with people who don't agree with you. So I I, I don't know how they're going to heal the rifts and and, and, and find unity um, the way that, to a certain extent, the Israelis have after October the 7th out of necessity. Um, certainly wouldn't want any, any kind of tragedy to happen. And short of that, I, I, I just don't see it happening in the few months to the election and, and to the convention and the election very easily. Yeah, and I do think, I think it is a communication thing. And one of my colleagues, Hugh Hewitt, uh, put out a good piece today where he said that if you remember back to 2016, one of the big things that tipped the scale in Donald Trump's favor was the fact he released this list of potential Supreme Court justices that he would he would pull from if he had to make a Supreme Court pick. And for a lot of yeah. people that thought that he didn't have the chops uh, to be president, it was the it was the turning point because it showed he was very thoughtful, that he thought about the most one of the most important jobs that presidents have. And it really, when you when you did exit polling, it was one of the things that changed a lot of people's minds. So what Hugh Hewitt is suggesting is that he needs to go ahead and tell people who his vice president's going to be. He needs to go ahead and tell people that maybe not which person's going to go in each cabinet position, but the group of people that he's going to be picking from so that people can see that they're solid, top-notch folks that can get the job done because the benefit that donald trump has quite frankly is that he can hit the ground running he's not your traditional guy that's challenging an incumbent because he's done the job before yeah i i agree completely uh i I think that would be a very good move for him to make to uh, name um at least a few people and bring some uh, clarity to the situation um that certainly would help unite people around him who are going to support him. Um, I mean, I just, the thing, you know, the State of the Union was so divisive. It was a campaign speech. I mean, just Joe Biden just 
keeps cooking his goose. I, I, I just can't understand how the Democrats can run him. I mean, a, apart from the frailty and, and, and cerebral issues, whatever they might be, in fact, I, I mean, it's just so divisive. And, and um, you know, he, he was, this, this rematch, if indeed it happens, is going to be quite different than the last one. Uh, the last one, he was the great unifier. He was going to bring everyone together. Uh, in fact, you know, having his strings pulled by the Sanders, Obama, that sort of group, He's just turned out to be incredibly left and very divisive, and uh, all the shouting and screaming in the State of the Union, all the, you know, I mean, it's just, it's got to be a shoe in for the Donald, frankly, because, I mean, who's going to vote for this guy? And what's amazing is they've got no one else. Now, all that in itself should make all the Republicans very happy, and they should look forward to uh, a hoped for victory. But as I say, the divisions are just so deep over these issues, um, starting with, you know, the Palestine thing and more money for Ukraine. And it's very hard, Martha. I mean, you can make a great argument why if you don't give that money to Ukraine, Putin is going to do a Hitler on Europe and just take everything over. And, you know, who knows who's next? And with the axis of him and China and Iran and North Korea, Lord knows what we're facing. They well, and they're doing they're here. doing naval exercises in the Middle East this week. Those yeah. four countries, yeah. and so yeah, it, and then it the, is, yeah, and then it, the, it's a real problem. And um, you're right; we usually get out of these kind of cycles with some horrible thing happening, and, yeah, and we other, don't want the other that. Side of the coin, yeah. The other side of the coin. The other side of the argument is, <clears throat> you know. God, look at these people starving. Look at how Americans are having to live. Look at the cost of living crisis. Look, you know, I mean, the, the, who gives a darn what's happening? You know, thousands of miles away. Look what's look what's happening to Chicago, my hometown. I mean, you know, what a mess. What a just. They're going to try. I heard somebody say they're going to try to stop the homicides for the convention. I mean, my God, you know, it's just. Well, and so, it is something where. It, it seems to me very logical that you got to take care of your own backyard before you can go and fix anybody else's. And really, that, really, unless you got <laughs> unless you got four terrifying nations yes. that are going to be on your foot on your doorstep controlling you a year from now. No, I understand what you're saying, but I'm I'm just saying it's, things have got to go. What makes a lot of people mad is that you have Joe Biden and others talking about other countries' borders. But they don't want to talk about our borders. And so it's it's a problem. But I want to shift gears a little bit to something a little bit lighter, I guess, uh, because you live in England. And I you know, there's this controversy about this picture that the Princess of Wales released on Sunday. And, um, you know, I I guess I don't understand the hoopla because, um, you know, picture editing uh, for portraits especially has been going on forever i mean you and i are people that go and get our headshot taken every now and then and believe me i tell the guy to make me look 10 years younger okay i don't want it to look like me i want it to look good so um why do you why is this such an issue where you've got a lot of people saying you can't trust the monarchy because they release this edited picture of the family this is just this is just nuts. This is insane. I mean, uh, there are a lot of people saying, well, we can never trust these people. I mean, you know, how ridiculous. I mean, what you say about uh, touching up and photoshopping is absolutely true. And I, I just don't understand the the ruckus. Uh, uh, the sleeve of the kid is a blah, blah. She's not wearing her wedding ring and her engagement ring. That means that they're, you know, like Harry and Meg. I mean, this just goes on and on, and people got nothing better to talk about. I mean, who gives a darn? You know, it's just I, they're making see, such a thing your, out of it. No. 
that's your American sensibilities there because it is to me it it was just a picture that she tried to release a nice picture on Mother's Day and and I don't know about over where you are but over where we are all you do is see ads pop up on your feed for these new phones that you can do any you can make your pictures look any way you want them to do I remember you can take a picture and and, and take Monica Zoller out that's the right and table and the rest of the family yeah and it's funny yeah. I I've told this story before. Um, um, Cindy Crawford did an interview back at the height of her career after she was in the swimsuit edition. So this would have been in the early 90s. And she was talking about how they had to airbrush her thighs. And I remember thinking to myself, if Cindy Crawford has got to have her thighs airbrushed, then there is no hope for a regular girl like me. And so, <laughs> this, you know, this kind of thing has been done forever and ever and ever. To think that people don't want to look as good as they can look in photos, it's just ridiculous. Now, I think it's more uh, that, you know, we don't really know what was wrong with her. Right. We don't we don't really know what's still wrong with her, if anything. We don't know why we're not seeing and hearing more about her, whereas Charles was so open, although we don't really know what's wrong with him. They say it's pancreatic cancer, which is horrible, but hasn't been confirmed. I, I think it's I think the photo complaining it's really just a symptom of the dissatisfaction with the public, those people who are interested, uh, uh, that they want to know more about lovely Kate, and they're not getting it. Right, right. Because she is very, very popular, and people feel like they know her, they like her, they feel like she's one of them, right? And and she crosses that line, doesn't she, between being royal and being like a regular person. And so... Well, if it, It's easy to fall out with the media and the public. I mean, I can remember how how thrilled every single Briton seemed to be with Meghan joining the royal family, a person of color. I mean, everybody was so excited here. It was so wonderful that we're so liberal and so blah, 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 blah. And I can remember, I can remember getting calls from friends in India the night that Rishi Sunak was made the first Asian British Asian prime minister and they were talking about the Indian Raj. I mean, you know, there was the British Raj when Britain ran India and now the Indians back in in Delhi were all saying, hey, it's the Indian Raj. We're running Britain and everybody loved it. And I mean, they both been such a disappointment Um, and it's, it's very easy to fall out of favor. So I think that Kate has fallen out of favor a bit by, by, you know, allowing herself uh, or or being made, whatever, to shroud herself in a bit of mystery about this illness, uh, which, of course, is her own private business. I mean, there's nobody entitled to know. She doesn't want to talk about it. But, you know, the media, the British media, is pretty cruel sometimes if they want to be. Um, and I, I think that's what's going on. I don't know how it will resolve itself. People are sick and tired of Harry and Meghan thing. So, you know, they want any, and Andrew, and they just they just don't want any more aggro, as we call it here, aggravation from the royals. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com, and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.